my vocabulary, words like failure or poverty, they don't make part of who I am. When I was out there, it wasn't about me being black and female. I had to work very hard to get to where I am. You find your identity, you find your purpose. Watching Visionaries Lounge, good evening and welcome. On the 2nd of May in 1976, just weeks before the turbulent Soweto uprisings, a little girl was born. She would grow to take hold of that for which the class of 76 fought by becoming a world-renowned, award-winning scientist. She joins us this evening and help me to welcome Dr. Patience Mtunzi Kufa. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Ayanda. I feel honored to be in the show. I believe your mom was saying that you were just crying, perhaps in solidarity with the class of 76 as a little one. I think I must have been saying, Amanda, <laughs> and my mom didn't understand it. Yeah. <laughs> what was it like, though, growing up, in fact, in the heart of, of, of the uprisings? It was in Orlando West, I believe? It was in Orlando West. Mm. So, I, yeah, I, I spent all of my life in Soweto, mm. um, firstly in Orlando West, in my grandmother's house. That's where I was brought up. And then when my aunt, uh, my mother's youngest sister, when she bought a house, because she was a teacher, when she bought a house in uh, Protea North, I moved with her to Protea. Mm. Yeah, so I, I lived and yeah, studied in Soweto. I went to government schools in Soweto mm. up until um, grade 12. Then I think it was called Standard 10 metric. Yeah. It must have been quite difficult. Mom was a single parent at the time. You had to move from granny to your aunt, etc. What was it like at that time? Yeah, it was obviously not easy. Um, my mom didn't have a house of her own then, so you know my grandmother felt it better for her to leave her children with her while she moved. So my grandmother offered my mom to stay with us, and my, my grandmother had a lot of people obviously living in the house. You know, I had many of my other cousins and some of my uncles were still there. I think two of my aunts as well were still in the house and it was a, a two bedroom and you know dining and, and yeah, kitchen. Your, your usual four room so house. Four usual four room yeah. house. So it was quite intimate but you know it, it, crowded as it was it, it was the most it was the best household I've ever been in in my life vibrant full of life and full of wisdom my yeah. grandmother wasn't educated but she was a woman of wisdom that mm -hmm. woman was mm -hmm. was clever to the core you know so she she instilled good values in us a woman of very high standards mm -hmm. and very high morals you know and yeah my grandmother taught us to love ourselves and I mean how much more can you teach a child if you if you love yourself you know yourself and you can you know drive your purpose Ah, so I think that's where you got your tenacity yes, from. Yeah. What did you want to do when you went to school initially? When I went to school initially, I wanted to be a doctor. Mm. I wanted to operate people and see what in the, what's in the inside and, you know, just help people. I wanted to heal people. And whenever there was, I, I remember there would be sometimes dead animals in the yard, you know, whether it's a rat or it's a, it's a dove. I remember one morning we got up and there was a dove um, just next to the outside toilet at my grand's house. And, I went after it and I started opening it up because I was curious to see oh what's inside. <laughs> and obviously my, 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 my girl cousins were running away and yeah. they were like, oh, you're squeamish, you, yeah. you're just you're disgusting, you know. Yeah. The boys were the ones that were wanting to see what's in there. But I mean, I under that was dissection. At first hand, one right there. 101 at that know, age. Right yeah. there, yeah. And then, so, so you grow up and then you go to high school and, and then what happens? And then what happened is when I got to high school, um, I think just as most young people would relate, I wasn't sure anymore what I wanted to do. You know, I, I didn't have anyone guiding me as to do this, don't do that. So when I finished my trick in 1994, in 1995, I had sort of like a gap year, but it wasn't a gap year per se because I was registered with UNISA doing psychology. And yeah, UNISA was a long distance um, institution then. So I was doing my psychology via correspondence. Mm -hmm. During that year, I think that's when it dawned to me that this is not for a young person. You can't be you know, on a long, in a long distance yeah. institution. Get yourself in a proper institution where you can go to the lab and do research. So when you were in university, mm -hmm. speak to me about that experience. What was that like? So when I was in university, I was offered a place in three institutions. It was the University of Cape Town Vets, and then called the Diranse Africanse yes. Universiteit. Rao. Rao. Yes. yes. Now it's called UJ. And my mom made it clear to me because she was sponsoring me. She was sponsoring my education that I'm not going to be in Cape Town because it's too far. Yeah. 
And at that time, I think early 90s, mid 90s, uh, there were a lot of um, disruptions in vets, you know. Yeah. And my mom said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not happy with you joining vets. So you're just gonna it's have going to make to Rao work. work. Rao was, uh, the, the medium of instruction was Afrikaans. Was Afrikaans, especially yeah. for um, BSc, you know, for the natural sciences, the classes, the study guides, the books, most of the material was in Afrikaans. So I literally had to translate everything from Afrikaans to English first, first before, before you could I even study. study it. So it was like, you know, a double amount of work Did for me. Did you have to do that yourself? I had to do that myself. I had an English Afrikaans dictionary mm -hmm. and I had uh, lots of textbooks that, you know, ha had a similar content to the mm -hmm. Afrikaans books. So, you, you know, like, because the scientific terms are similar to a certain yeah. degree, you could tell that, okay, it's the same concept. Yeah, so it was very difficult because I'd been coming from a, a majorly English medium school, mm -hmm. and now there I was at university level, you know, wi which is a totally different world that shocks your mm -hmm. system. To begin to be, with, to be never mind in the Afrikaans, language. Yeah. Yes. That, that was, yeah, it, it was something big to get over. What made you press on? I think the fact that I didn't want to disappoint my mother, mm. and I hate failing. Mm. I, in my vocabulary, words like failure or poverty don't even, they don't make part of who I am. Mm. So I knew that if I don't have this education, chances are I'll grow up, you know, poor or, you know, no, not so well made. and. Yeah, I, I just had to press on because I, I also wanted to prove to myself that I can make something better of myself. Mm -hmm. You know, something my mom aspired to have and because of her conditions never had. I, I wanted to change that, yeah. I wanted to also, you know, going forward, um, bring this legacy in the family that it's possible we can do it. You know, And my grandmother always tol told us that, you know, be the best you can in life. and. I was yet to find the best that I can be, mm. you know, so I had to press on. So you qualified with, with which qualification? So I qualified, my first degree was a BSc in yes. Biological Sciences with major zoology and uh, I think botany. Mm -hmm. Then I changed because botany and zoology are similar. Mm. I then changed when I was in my honours uh, year, I, I changed to biochemistry. Yeah. And then my, my honors was in biochemistry. When I got to master's level, I did research, but it was in HIV, so it became mm. medical biochemistry. And yeah, that was in 2002. In 2003, I got a job at the National Institute for Communicable Diseases, mm. the NICD, and I worked in an HIV lab there for about a year and a, and a bit. And then in 2004, I joined CSIR mm -hmm. with a master's in medical biochemistry. Yes. But when I joined, during my interview for that job, I was, I was asked if I was interested in doing a PhD. Mm. And I knew it wasn't going to be a PhD in, in biochemistry. It was, it was going to be, physical. yeah, because the unit I was going, I was being interviewed in for a job was majorly physics based, you yes. know, so, and laser physics. And at that time, I had no idea what a laser was. I didn't know uh, what biophotonics was, but I knew that... I don't that know what biophotonics <laughs> I, I knew yeah. that the lab was, uh, the, the unit was wanting yeah. to start a biophotonics lab or facility. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I knew that there was going to be a big switch in disciplines for me. And, yeah, I embraced that. I want to see what that big switch did for you and where it took you. Because if I look to my left, yes. I'm seeing awards galore. We'll get into that conversation after this. Do stay with us. Welcome back and thanks again for joining us. Our guest this evening was recognized by Forbes magazine as being one of the 20 youngest power women in Africa for her exceptional contribution in science. Help me to welcome once again Dr. Uh, Patience Mtunzi Ufa. Thank you so much again uh, for staying with us. Uh, talk to me now about your rise to power because you then got this opportunity to do your PhD. What kind of experience did you uh, get there? Um, I wonder, actually, when you speak about this power thing, it frightens me because, like, is she talking about me? Um, yeah, I, I did my PhD at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, mm -hmm. and I joined the biophotonics lab there. And upon coming back in 2010, I knew that I, I had to do 
a transfer of some sort of skills, you know, to a point when my supervisor offered me a job overseas, I said, no, I'm going to be well placed in South Africa and I can make a better contribution there. Because, you know, overseas, every second person has a PhD, whereas this side, we're still trying to concentrate the pool of PhDs, you know, so I thought, mm -mm, I'm going to be better placed back home, you know, where I can generate more Dr. Mtunzis and needed yeah, I'm, I'm needed much more wow. there. So I started this um, uh, research laboratory at the CSIR called the Biopho Biophotonics Facility. And yeah, it's, I mean, it's a unique lab in the sense that it mixes disciplines. You know, we've got a chemistry lab alongside a mammalian culture lab for, for doing cell work. And then that's adjacent a photonics lab where we've got big lasers, you know, lasers of different types that help us to do experiments, you know. And we, we're working on stem cell research, we're working on HIV, we do some cancer cell research there as well. So yeah, that, that's the work that I do. It's very different in South Africa, particularly. It's a different facility. One can easily be intimidated by what you're talking about now, but what is the practical application of what you do? We want to one day um, better the HIV diagnostics. Mm -hmm. Instead of having a test s telling us that this patient is positive or negative, can it give us more information? Can it speak to different types of uh, virions that are in the systems? You know, can, can it tell us the different subtype of HIV that the patient has? Mm -hmm. Can it tell us the progression of disease? You seem incredibly passionate about, the, about the, 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 the scourge of HIV AIDS in the country because it goes back to your varsity days. Yes. You mentioned it there yes. and, and it's come up again now in your professional life. Why? Yes. That's because when I was doing it at varsity, I was really passionate on can I try and solve this problem? Remember earlier I told you I love solving problems yes. and for me it was HIV is this big scare and it's a big problem for everybody, not only in Africa, but you know, all over the world. Can we try and do something to solve this problem? So when I got to the, the biophotonics lab and one of the novel ideas I had was that of mixing photonics and the HIV research. And there's very few labs around the world that does that, you know. In South Africa, I wouldn't be surprised. We're the only lab that does that. You know, we can now introduce drugs ARVs directly into HIV infected cells and that now deals with the concentration, the amount of drugs that get into the infected cells because when you take the drugs by mouth, um, they have to go through various channels before they get to you know, the sites where the virus is laying in high concentration. Yes. So if we can target those sites using an optical fiber like diagnostic tool or you know, um, technology that we've made, then we can up the concentration of ARVs that's taken by those cells in those in that site because you find that you take 100% of the drug but mm. by the time it gets to sites where it matters it's like maybe 10-20%. We are currently using laser pulses to poke or drill extremely tiny holes which open and close almost immediately in HIV infected cells in order to deliver drugs within them. How is that possible you may ask? Well, we shine a very powerful but super tiny laser beam onto the membrane of HIV infected cells while these cells are immersed in liquid containing the drug. I feel like I'm back in a biology class, but my biology teacher has never looked this good. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you now, <laughs> nails up to date, hair up to date, everything looking so, so beautiful. Uh, is that a concerted effort on your behalf where you're saying, I want young black women to know that being a scientist is not something that makes you look dull and boring and great. You can look good and, and, and kick butt and take down names in science at the same time. For sure. I mean, when you think about scientists, already people have got a preconceived idea or picture of what a scientist is meant to look like. You know, bold hair, most of the time gray, white, and um, spectacles, and clever to a point of not knowing whether you're coming or going. Yeah. You know, you can still be a normal human being, I, I think I'm normal, and, and be a scientist. I mean, you say, you know, you're an ordinary person, et cetera, et cetera, but your accolades would like to differ. Your accolades speak of someone who's exceptional. Talk, talk to me about these. So that was, um, I got two best PhD student awards when I came back in 2010. One was particularly at the unit I work at, at the National Laser Center, and one was CSIR-wide. Mm -hmm. CSIR has biannual, um, 
award ceremonies and that one was for 2010 and mm -hmm. I was like the best PhD student at CSIR across CSIR so yeah that, that's one of them and the other one was just within my unit you know mm. so. I don't know if we have time to go through each and every one of your awards because there are many this one's my favorite the order of Mapungub and I'm going to open it here because this is recognition by the highest office in the land. This is a recognition by the head of state, by the entire South Africa, to say job well done. Patience Mtunzi. The order of Mapungu Ufie in bronze, awarded to Patience Mtunzi for her achievement in the field of biophotonics and her invaluable contribution to scientific research in South Africa and internationally. You don't get these randomly, eh? You don't just get them given away somewhere. How does this make you feel? I wonder if it's mine, you know, because <laughs> I, I, Let me I read still, the name. Oh, no, it's yours. <laughs> I, still it's have, I still have a lot to achieve. Mm. I, I wasn't expecting this to happen so early in my career. You know, I was expecting this to happen when I've, I've had, like, you know, a Nobel mm. Prize or, I've, I've, you know, I've, I've, I've invented something big, you know, not just for pioneering biophotonics and, you know, being a lead scientist in biophotonics in South Africa and having some international recognition. I, I, I thought that came too early, but who am I to say no? I like that. Wonderful. But when we come back, I want to discuss something. I want to talk about the part that is coming up. I see the ring. <laughs> It is so big, I'm getting blinded by the <laughs> reflection of it. Ginger. Absolutely beautiful. We talk about what you're doing next with your life, even on a personal perspective, just after this. Do you stay with us. Hello again. If I'm looking a little bit puzzled and frazzled today, you'll know why. Because my guest this evening is the first person in South Africa to qualify with a PhD in biophotonics. Biophotonics. Yes. What was that like? Well, you know, okay, I, I am a pion pioneer in biophotonics, mm. but my dream or my vision going forward is to have people qualify in, you know, multidisciplinary fields you know, that, that no one has qualified in before and not have it like surprise or baffle people. It mustn't you know? be unusual. It, it mustn't be unusual. It must be something that's natural. And that, that's what I'm working towards, you know, getting young women qualify in these awesome fields and it being like the norm in South Africa, you know. So uh, how intimidating was someone, was it, you know, it for someone to come and approach you? I'm talking about your husband. Because <laughs> you're a newlywed. Um, Shela Ranjani, um, to own a PhD in biophotonics. What, how did you guys meet? <laughs> we met, uh, it's work, it's, it was via work. Mm -hmm. I needed him to do something for me, and mm -hmm. I was going to help him with something. I thought it was just work, but mm -hmm. he had other ideas, of mm -hmm. course. Mm -hmm. And um, I think he would be the better person to ask Um, Shela Ranjani, um, to But you know, my husband is a leader in his own right. You know, he's, he's an achiever in his own right. So I, I don't think someone like me made him intimidated, you know, because he also intimidates a lot of other people out there, yeah. you know. So, I, and I, I'm, I'm grateful to God for blessing me with such a, a supportive partner, because it would have been a problem to get someone who who or doesn't exactly complex, who, yes. who doesn't really get being with a powerful or strong yeah. woman but we we both are leaders i, mm. I must say and yeah. how do you find yourself in the role of wife now because you're powerful you're go-getter you're used to your own space i'd imagine you know doing your own thing and now you're you're part of a team it's not an issue mm. he's very easy to love mm. you know it's, i i, I we, we pray together and submitting for me to a man like that is 
absolutely no issue. I love yeah, yeah, I, I, I think it just comes naturally. I don't have to force it or anything. I know my place as a woman when I'm at home. When I'm in the lab, I'm a scientist. When I'm at home, I'm a wife and soon a mother. You know, so it's, it's, it's nothing. There, there's no rocket science there. It, it, things just have to fall in place. Mm. You know, soon a mother. Yeah, that leads me to your future goals, aspirations, dreams. Tell me about that. Yeah, in the future, we'd like to, you know, have a family of our own and achieve, you know, much more things in the sciences. You know, there's, I've got students now that have just registered under me in the lab and I'm supervising them at master's and PhD level. If I can get a few good PhDs and, you know, a few good um, master's graduates to my name, that would be lovely because then it means, you know, I'm contributing positively to the country. I'm contributing to the sciences. If we could get a few technology demonstrators, patents and, you know, novel devices coming out, you know, some, some tangible outputs that could help our country because the mandate of CSIR is to, you know, develop a technology that's going to improve people's lives, you know. So if we can live up to that mandate, that would be very good for me. You know what's very good for me? Mm. The fact that you are so selfless. You know, usually when you find a powerful woman in the boardroom and they're only, they're only black women to do A, B, and C, they'll climb the ladder, then close the door behind them so that no one must come and disrupt the status that I have. But you, on the other hand, are saying, the more the merrier, make the circle bigger. Yes. I want more people to, to, to achieve what I've achieved. Yeah. No, we need that for our country. We, 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 I mean, if, if I'm going to stop where I... And this is what made me come back as well. If I was just going to stay overseas and, and have a good life there, what good does it do for South Africa, you know? Uh, no good whatsoever. And there's a lot of talent in South Africa. I would hate to see that go to waste. Mm. I'm hearing that you've learned a lot of lessons. Oh, and there goes my pearls in this beautiful <laughs> display. But any of those learned from this particular lady? She was humble to the core and she achieved so much. She got some recognition, but in my books, I think she was supposed to get much more than she got, you know? I mean, that's Nobel Prize material. She never got one. But this is the first lady of physics research, you know? Mm -hmm. The likes of Madame Marie Curie, she discovered two uh, elements of the peri periodic table, you know, the, the, the chemistry periodic mm -hmm. table. A lady discovered two of those elements, polonium and radium and she got um, two Nobel Prizes, one in physics, one in, in chemistry. Those are the people make you think and make you see that if it was possible for them with you know, little resources that they had, it could be possible for anyone. We've got the likes of Professor Tibel Lonyokong, who's a professor at Rhodes University. She's making cancer drugs. You know, it, those are the people we look up to as young scientists. If they can make it, then we can make it. I know you don't do this for the accolades, but what more would you still like to achieve? If one day I would be called to come and receive a Nobel Prize, 